I'm excited to talk about these categories. We're going to be discussing the three short categories for the Oscars. I don't think there's any other coverage of these categories currently online. So we have a bit of an exclusive here today. I'm joined by Tony Ruiz, Charlie Bright, and Zach Laws. We're going to start off with Best Animated Short. And right off the bat, I want to know what are your personal preferences? The one of the five that really just hit me like a ton of bricks was was late afternoon um uh and it's also kind of personal that that one because i have a elderly grandmother who's you know having some memory issues and and the way that that played out just really was just lovely um i don't know if that's the one that's going to win but that was my personal favorite of the five uh my personal favorite it would definitely be uh it's close between bow and uh, animal behavior. Uh, I really, I really enjoyed that one because I like when, I like when animation, you know, is not just afraid to just be ridiculously funny. And I really felt like uh, animal behavior uh, did a great job with that. But Bao is also just completely heartwarming. It, it, it's almost impossible not to love that one. Well, I like all five of them for different reasons, and I think that you know, of all the short categories, this one represents the most um, diversity of content, shall we say? Um, you know, in the in the sense that you know, animal behavior kind of feels like the pilot for an animated sitcom, um, whereas you know, Weekend is much more experimental and avant garde and much darker. So I like that that kind of spectrum is in this category. Um, of the five, um, you know, my personal favorite would probably be Weekends, just because of how weird and oddly poignant it is. I had the same thoughts as Tony, basically. So I wanted to know if we all did, and then maybe I could switch my prediction to that. That's not the case, though. I, I'm going with Bow just because um, it's Pixar. Uh, they, they, you know, part of Disney, I guess. And Disney wins every couple of years. It seems like they're a safe bet. Uh, but yeah, I was wondering if Late Afternoon would have resonated with you guys as well. Usually in this category, we have a bunch of, or we've got, you know, a short about cute animals. We don't really have that this year. This year we've got animal behavior, which is about, you know, more adult themes. And I feel like those ones usually do not win out. Usually we've got like four for kids, one for adults, and the apple in the bag of oranges rule does not apply. Well, I'm also going with bow, and I think that, um, you know, it, it kind of, uh, it does that Pixar thing that their animated shorts usually do, and, and it's why they usually win this category, which is that they just lob it right down the middle, you know? Um, they're cute, and they're also poignant, um, and, you know, very concise as well. They're, you know, these are usually the things that play in front of uh, their animated features. Um, so that also helps. It's the most visible of the five um, so I think this is a pretty easy call. Actually, I agree with that. Um, I think Bao is probably out front because it's it's also, in addition to being just probably the most widely seen, it's a very likable one, and it has that um, recurring Pixar theme of uh, parents and children and the relationship between them. You know what, ha and the idea of what happens when uh, the children leave and. Uh, to combine that with delicious um, Chinese cooking is just, you know, just fantastic. Um, uh, so, you know, yeah, that, that pleases two audiences right there. Uh, do we think that it will be an issue that the Academy is still 85% white and perhaps cannot relate to the struggles of a Chinese mother? Well, I mean, that's assuming that they've all watched the movies and um, they probably, <laughs> I think they're voting for the one uh, that they've heard of the most. So they, they might just vote for Bao without even having watched it, honestly, you know. I feel like we usually think that though, but Disney, you know, they'll win one year, then they lose an X, win yeah. one year, lose an X. So it does seem like people are watching these in general. I would say the exception is last year when uh, Kobe Bryant won. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, we've kind of we've kind of pushed that from our minds. I mean, I, I I'm just <laughs> uh, I think that late afternoon does seem like the most reasonable spoiler because uh, that and uh, one small step both have like an emotional resonance to it. They both deal with um, parents and 
you know, one small step deals with losing a parent and, and following your dreams, whereas late afternoon deals with losing a parent in a more metaphorical sense, you know, since you're, uh, they're going through memory loss and forgetting about you. So, I mean, one of those two could perhaps um, have a special resonance to voters. That's one which we've talked about only a little bit is weekends. Uh, I think the problem with that one is even though it just won the Annie for Best Short, uh, I think that it tackles very similar subject matter to Bao, and Bao is more concise and just accessible because it's Pixar. One that I would look actually look out for is Animal Behavior because it is really the truly, like, if we're talking apple in a bag of oranges, it is the tr one truly, like, just flat out comic uh, piece. Um, and so that could certainly... That could certainly give it some resonance, but yeah, I'm I'm predicting Bao. I would love it if late late afternoon won because it was my favorite. Um, but this is a really strong category. I think each of them has their strengths, and each each of them would be a, a a worthy winner, which we might not be able to say about certain other categories. You know, I have to say, um, speaking of animal behavior being a comedy, I watched all fifteen of these shorts. Uh, basically, binge them over the last two days. Animal Behavior was the very first one I watched, uh, and I did not realize that it was the only time I was going to be laughing for the next few hours. I mean, it's, <laughs> this is the most depressing crop of short films I've ever seen in my life. What is well, wrong with the short? Well, the documentaries, though, that's always a given. The documentaries yeah. are always, especially if you're going to watch them one right after the other, they can be really tough to get through. But it's something, I mean, usually in like the live action ones, there's a little bit of diversity in the sense that, you know, there's usually at least one comedy, um, you know, so there's something that's maybe a little more uplifting. And then obviously you've got your films that deal with your heavy, you know, weighty social issues. But this was just one after another after another. I hope that Academy members don't watch these all <laughs> um, the way that I did. I actually watched Animal Behavior last out of all of them. And I thought it was funny, but I couldn't tell if it was actually funny or if I was just really tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the way that they presented the uh, the shortlisted uh, contenders to the nominating committee is they actually screen them in order of aspect ratio. Hmm. I don't know which end they started at, but that's the way they did it. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to best documentary short. Oh, God. <laughs> yes, uh, I would say uh, there was one last year traffic stop uh, of the nominees that I never got a chance to see. I would say any of the other four that I saw last year would easily win this year. I think this is a very poor crop. Tony, I know that you think that it is between two films, and I agree with that. So I'm curious if you think it's between the same two that I do, which are period, end of sentence, and lifeboat. Uh, no, I don't think it's those two. Actually, the one the one that I had the biggest response to, and the one that I liked the most, was uh, Endgame. Um, I, I that that was an absolutely gut wrenching and yet respectful. Um, you know, Endgame is basically a look at like end of life care in a variety of settings, both at hospice and at hospitals, and it follows several cases, but one particular case of a, of a woman in her 40s that's dying of cancer, and uh, you know she has a small child, and her husband and her mother are back at her bedside, and they're trying to you know, make the end of life choices that uh, will be both respectful to their culture and, to, uh, and for her to not suffer. I just found that entire film just so engrossing um that it, it it was immediately my number one and nothing else really came close to it endgame is directed by jeffrey friedman and rob epstein who were previous oscar winners for uh the times of harvey milk uh in the feature category so they're certainly veteran documentarians who and, uh, know uh, how to put and uh there's another one they won how for. to make an american quilt was that the the stories of the quilt, yeah. Stories about yeah, the AIDS right, quilt. yeah, yeah. So they certainly know how to make a compelling documentary film. 
Um, my only hesitation in predicting it is the fact that you know, it reminds me a lot of um, another Netflix documentary uh, that competed in this category a couple years ago, Extremis, which was also about end of life care. Um, and that was leading our odds for a while there. And as soon as I saw it, I thought there's no way that these octogenarians within the Academy are going to vote for a movie that reminds them of their impending doom. Um, now, perhaps, uh, I, I think that for me, it's between, I'm going with either that one or period end of sentence because they're both on Netflix and because I think that um, they are uh, the most accessible in a way, but period end of sentence I think is more uplifting because it's about women, you know, uh, taking their you know, feminine hygiene into their own hands and you know having some kind of um, you know say over their over their lives. Um, I think that that might actually you know stick out amongst this crop of five. That one was not made by Netflix, though, uh, so they won't be campaigning it. Uh, in recent years, Netflix and HBO have done very well, but we have nothing from HBO this year. Well, they are. I, I can tell you, right, they will be campaigning it because their chief Oscar campaigner, Lisa Tabak, is a producer on that movie. So <laughs> they are indeed campaigning it. Yeah, and I'm actually of the same. I think it's down to either uh, Endgame or period end, 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 end of sentence. Uh, it's... Uh, while the subject matter is similar to Extremis from a couple of years ago, this one is a lot more engaging and it's a lot more accessible. And even though, yes, it's talking about, you know, people confronting uh, their own mortality, you don't feel all doom and gloom by the end of it. You feel it's, I don't want to say it's uplifting, but it's definitely not depressing or like, horribly depressing either like extremis was so i actually think it actually has that you know, uh odd medium uh that odd uh you know in between level of just kind of hitting the right notes there but period end of, end of sentence what's really intriguing about that is also is it's not just showing the women uh taking uh control of their own uh of their own uh of the concept of feminine hygiene, but it's also showing how, you know, uh, using this machine to make uh, 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 sanitary pads uh, by using these machines and also show they're also um, they're destigmatizing uh, the whole concept of women's hygiene, which is insanely helpful to actually, you know, help them be able to sell the products at different markets and things like that. So I think that um, it's it's a really tough choice. I think I might give the edge to um, period and end of sentence because we've had other films, uh, specifically in this category, that have uh, chronicled uh, thing uh, issues within that region, uh, specifically like um, oh, what was the one uh, uh, Girl of the River a couple of years ago, and what was the other one that that we had like what was it like seven years ago? Um, uh, uh, it's it's killing me. Um, seven years ago, wow. Yeah, saving face, face yeah. saving face. And by the end of this documentary, you're, you're smiling. And I don't think you can say that about the other ones. And that's why I would probably give period end of sentence uh, a slight edge on that. Yeah, my hesitation with period end of sentence is largely because it is the one that has you smiling. Because I wonder if it's a bit too light. Whereas the other ones deal with Nazis and racism and life or death situations. Uh, this one, I wonder if it'll be dismissed because it's not dealing with something so heavy in this documentary category, which favors that kind of content. And yeah, I also that's... wonder with uh, you know the Academy being 70% male and older, if they'll be turned off uh, by talking about this kind of thing. Yeah, you know, you have to then wonder all right which uh which depressing social issue are they going to rally behind are they going to rally behind um black sheep which deals with horrific racism are they going to rally behind lifeboat which you know deals with refugees who are you know trying to come here for a better life and you know a, a large percentage of them end up drowning uh on their way here are they going to go with night at the garden which is 
all about Nazis and, you know, that's all the rage again these days. So, I mean, you know, I, I think we, we need to just say that there's no way a night at the garden is going to win this because it, as you know, it, the, it just shows the footage. There's no context to it. And that was immensely frustrating. And I, and the reason I'm, I, I, I'm so animated about this is because, you know, actually I find the whole idea of, you know, you know, like homegrown extremist movements uh, fascinates the hell out of me. Um, I don't know why it just does. And um, so like when I read this, what the film was about, it sounded really interesting and to watch the footage is really, is really interesting to watch, but there's no, there's no context to so much of it. There's, there's nothing identifying who this man is that is speaking on the stage, who organized this. There's nothing there, a guy, in the middle of this, a guy rushes the stage protesting. There's nothing in the movie about, about who that person is. And yeah. that's actually there's a, that's actually a fascinating story. If you go to the website for the movie, they actually have all the context of it on there. And I'm thinking to myself, why isn't this in the movie? Well, yeah, and that was my response to watching it was I felt like first of all, I felt like maybe there was a problem with the link. I was like, but that was it. That that's all there was. And then the second thought I had was this is great footage that would serve to anchor a much bigger story. Like, mm -hmm. I felt like it was footage in search of a documentary rather than just being its own thing. Um, and then when you get to uh, Black Sheep, um, I have real problems with that one, mainly because this is a documentary category. And I'd say probably a good 85% of that is filmed reenactments. So I'm like, why isn't this in the live action short category? Because... I, I'm waiting for the documentary aspect of this, um, and it just it just rubbed me the wrong way. I was like, "Why is this here?" In, in regards to a night at the garden, you know, the guy who made that movie is a two-time Oscar nominee in the feature category. He's the guy who made the documentary about um, Cory Booker's uh, mayoral run, Street Fight. Yeah, and also yeah, it's he, six run. Mm -hmm. he also made a movie called "If a Tree Falls: A Story of the Earth Liberation Front." Um, so you know, he's definitely a accredited documentarian. Um, I wish that he would have expanded a little bit more on, on this one. It's also got uh, Laura, Laura Poitras uh, producing it from- Oh, Center. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She won the documentary feature category a few years ago. I have problems with all of these nominees, um, but not necessarily because of the films themselves, but something like Black Sheep or A Night at the Garden. I think it's fine if you want to upload it to YouTube, which is originally the platform that A Night at the Garden was actually released on. It was released on YouTube in 2017. Then they took it to Sundance in 2018. Now they're at the Oscars. But you know, YouTube is has you know millions and millions of videos that could be considered uh, nonfiction or documentary. I don't know why these ones uh, the Oscars felt were so exceptional that they deserved Oscar nominations. A Night at the Garden, it seems, uh, it's amazing footage. I mean, I can't believe everyone had a smartphone back in 1939, but like, it seems like they just found other YouTube videos. They put them together on Windows Movie Maker and then, yeah, they just released it without any context, which is fine because it doesn't need any context, but I'm not sure why it deserves to be in this crop. Uh, I have the same issues with Black Sheep as Tony does um, Endgame, Charlie, you mentioned that it was it was kind of this in-between thing, which for me just makes it forgettable. And I also wasn't sure about what the film was actually about because it starts off, you know, kind of jumping from one patient to another, but then it kind of zeroes in on just a couple of them. And then it kind of goes back to ones they touched on earlier. So I was unclear about the focus of that film. And same with period end of sentence where it starts off about how women are oppressed but then they're just kind of running a startup. And then it kind of circles back around to how, you know, women are warriors and all that kind of stuff. Um, Lifeboat, uh, the, which you guys aren't really high on, but I think has a shot because I think it's the most important one uh, just because it's the longest one. Um, and yeah, people are dying in it. So I wonder if, even though it is so dull, if people will say like, okay, you know, those guys are doing great work and they need our support. 
like it kind of reminds me of the white helmets uh that netflix made which i didn't think was the strongest one but you know was about a group of people that were doing extremely important work plus at the end of lifeboat the guy dies there's you know a thing you know uh dedicated to the main character of the film the thing about lifeboat is that we've had uh the past several years in this category we've had movies that are specifically about um the the migrant uh situation that's happening in europe right now um with uh you have migrants say uh, uh fleeing their countries this one focused on people that were coming through the port from uh libya uh but are just coming from all over the mediterranean to try to get to europe and we've had several nominees like that uh they also there have been so it feels like for the past like four years there's been one a year and they all kind of just sort of blend in together to me um it just kind of feels like it, it if it couldn't break through in those other years i don't see why it would break through this year right yeah i mean i just you know uh, I, I think that quality wise it's probably the one that i have the least amount of problems with maybe um just in terms of like it being a traditional documentary um uh, but i do i, I do kind of wonder if it might be you know be you know because you are seeing actual dead bodies on the screen it might be just a little too hard to handle um you know yeah i i just i just feel like for you know endgame just Again, kind of like late afternoon, Endgame just kind of hit a uh, hit a nerve uh, with me, particularly. And I feel like you know it's it does it, it, it does feel to me like it's the most um, identifiable because it's something that everybody is going to have to go through or knows or maybe has gone through with with loved ones. And um, to walk that fine line between taking a subject that's really tough and really powerful and not make it morbid, um, ironic in a movie that's basically about people dying, um, but yet there was, a, there was a real dignity and respect to it. Um, that coupled with the fact that these are, you know, two Oscar winning filmmakers that, that know how to tell a story in a way that's, you know, that's heartfelt, emotional and respectful. Um, I feel like it might have the whole, I agree with completely with Charlie. I think lifeboat is kind of a, we've seen that before. Um, I don't remember what the one was. I think it was last year, but, uh, I know we had 4.1 miles a few years ago. I think that's, yeah, that was, so I feel like I don't know why lifeboat would win when this subject hasn't really resonated yet. And also, I mean, just to reiterate, like, uh, in game and period and of sentence have got all that Netflix money behind them. <laughs> you know, they've, uh, they've got, uh, the best campaigners in the world pushing, uh, for one of those two films to win. <laughs> uh, Tony, you mentioned that a night at the garden and black sheep will definitely not win, which I think we're pretty much in consensus about, but black sheep is actually leading the odds. Uh, what I love about, these categories is that they uh, are so hard to research, very hard to watch. So whatever happens to be ahead when the prediction center opens, just takes off. So Bao, and Black Sheep, and Marguerite have thousands of people predicting them to win. All the other nominees have either hundreds or dozens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I bet they quality. love being at the top of the alphabet. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think we've really narrowed it down to which one is going to win, but you're better off choosing something other than the odds leader, which is Black Sheep. So in best live action short, uh, this category is, I guess, more depressing than uh, oh my God. documentary short. Probably just for detainment alone. But... I was yelling at my phone when I was watching some of these. <laughs> in this category, Marguerite is leading the odds. Uh, it's the only one of the five that does not have children either in extreme peril or putting others in extreme peril. Uh, there are no children in extremely uncomfortable situations in Marguerite. Just one dying old woman. Yes. It's 
<laughs> oh, oh man, if I had only known that was going to be the most uplifting one of the bunch, <laughs> that's, I would have saved that for last. Holy that's the, cow. That's the comic masterpiece of this category. <laughs> yeah, which is crazy because, yeah, I, I knew that the other ones were all really heavy. So I was like, oh, it's, it's got to be Marguerite because it's the lightest. And I thought, hey, you know, it's probably even funny. But it really wasn't. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought it was pretty dull. Uh, how do we feel about Marguerite? Uh, you know, on its own merits. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a very simple movie. You know, it's it's there's nothing very flashy about it. Um, it just really does rely on um, the relationship of the two women at the center of it. Um, and it is, you know, it is very touching kind of at the end, you know, because um, and also, um, you know, kind of socially relevant as well. You know, it's all about this old woman who's dying and um, her caregiver is uh, a lesbian and uh, the woman reveals that she was also at one point in her life in love with a woman, but, you know, couldn't say so because of the time she was living in. Um, and so there's this kind of like sort of sweet poignancy at the end where, you know, they, they connect on that level um, as she's rubbing lotion on her legs. Um, Zach, so you're making it sound so great. <laughs> well, that's a, I'm, I've, I've recapped the entire movie, so that's the that's the plot of the film. There, um, I it's mean, that thirty seconds spread out over twenty minutes. I yeah. mean, look, uh, you know, just looking back on it now and thinking about every single one of these movies where some kind of awful thing happens with a child, or you know, like it's it's truly um, it might win just by being the least depressing of the bunch. Yeah, if you want to talk apples in a in a bag of oranges, that that is the one that is different, and that one does. That's a really of... depressing bag of oranges. I think <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Growing <laughs> everywhere. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, th 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 these are some tough movies. I mean, let's talk about Skin for a second. Um, yeah, which has wow. already been made into a feature. I see. Um, it's the most technically accomplished, I suppose, of the bunch. Um, it has some recognizable TV actors in it, like Jonathan Tucker and um, the child from This Is Us, who plays young Randall. I believe that's him. Um, and, Daniel, and Daniel McDonald from uh, Dumplin'. Right, yeah, yeah. Jonathan Tucker is an actor who I always am glad to see working. Uh, he's a fan of Gold Derby, you know. He's a because he's yeah. like because he's one of my I I adore him. I think he's a great actor, and he's one of those people who I he just you know it just it, it you know uh, the huge things never happened, but he still works consistently, and I'm always glad when I see him when I see him working. So I'm uh, I, I'm I would probably go with Skin. Um, and it raises some really interesting questions. Um, but, you know, I'm not quite sure how successfully it, you know, answers them or raises them for that matter. And, I mean, watching the movie, it just made me so uncomfortable and nauseous in, in ways that I couldn't have imagined. I mean, um, and then I, I watched the rest of them. And, <laughs> and, just, and then you could. <laughs> I, yeah. The, the thing about Skin is that even though it is about, you know, these uncomfortable situations and it's hard to watch like the other ones, in the end, the bad guys do get some comeuppance, which I'm not sure can be said about Mother. And it's in a way that I, it's, it also happens in a way that I actually found surprising. Mm -hmm. um, did, yeah. Because I actually thought it was going to be something, it was going to be something, it was going to be another method that they would get that comeuppance. Uh, so when that come up, it's happened. So I was first like, oh, okay, it happened. And I was like, and then when you see how it came about, you're like, oh, oh, okay, wow, all right. <laughs> so, um, and it's, it, I don't know. I think, I think it, it does stand an outside chance of winning. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm actually, unlike, I'm actually predicting it. Yeah, I am too, actually. Yeah, I think it's between that and Marguerite. Well, why why are you picking that one over Marguerite? Just because of how technically accomplished it is, and um, because it features 
you know, I mean, as we record this on February the 5th, we are, you know, in the middle of one hell of an awful Black History Month between, you know, the controversies with the governor of Virginia wearing blackface, uh, and that kind of relates to the ending of skin in an odd way, um, you know, and, and all these other awful stories about, you know. God damn um, it. Yeah, it does. It's just really... Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I guess I could see it um, really resonating um, with certain voters who feel socially conscious and want to make a statement against all the, you know, racist cosplayers uh, working in our government today. I feel like films about racism tend to do very well in this category at getting nominations. They don't tend to win because there's always one Uplif uh, uplifting film about a child that goes on to win. Uh, we don't have that this year, so I'm wondering oh, if this is we, <laughs> No, we do not. <laughs> can we just, yeah, can we just talk about the other nominees in this category? Yeah. Oh, so, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think yeah. I need to take some Paxil first, yeah. but yeah, all right. I don't even know do where it. we should start. Well, um, we've been how about the one with kids thought. killing other kids? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, detainment I, oh. it, it became almost comedic in just how far it went and how much more brutal it became. And it was totally unpredictable at every step in the way I found as I was unfamiliar with uh, this story. You know, this is based on a true story, uh, which is absolutely horrific. Um, and uh, I don't have a problem with making a film about this awful event uh, as a true crime fanatic you know i was i was familiar with what happened i do have a problem with turning it into like a episode of law and order um because every kind of stylistic decision that the filmmaker makes just feels ripped out of the dick wolf playbook um trying to i guess gen up suspense and also i mean this film has got a little bit of controversy around it because the filmmaker did not contact the family of the victim to let them know that he yeah. was making this. Yeah, we should say that you know the, this is the this is a story about uh, the death of James Bulger, who yeah. was a two-year-old child in Britain who was very savagely murdered by uh, two uh, ten-year-old boys. The two boys were convicted and were the are, are, I believe still remain the youngest uh, convicted murderers. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the dialogue in the film is taken directly from the transcripts of the interrogations of these two boys. And you're right, Zach, they, they did the, there's been a lot of uh, press about this, particularly in terms of the fact that the, the, that James Bolger's mother was not, uh, really consulted and she's been very vocal in her attitude about the film. My problem with the film, uh, first of all, I do want to say that um, the performances of these two children um, uh, are, are, are absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I would actually go so far as to say that they're better performances than anything nominated in Best Actor. Um, mm. <laughs> but there is this kind of there's this this lens that the film is looking through that I had a really big problem with, that it's not about this crime per se as it is about the two boys who committed the crime in a way that almost engenders some degree of sympathy. Mm -hmm. To paint the children as anything other than what they were, which were monsters, uh, it seems very irresponsible. I mean, the victim in this case was James Bolger. This was not an accidental killing. They set out to do something horrific, uh, you know, to torture this little toddler and beat him so brutally that they couldn't even distinguish what the fatal blow was. So, you know, I think it's just... Zach, you're not doing it justice. It's much worse than that. <laughs> I'm trying to be diplomatic. Uh, it's just... <laughs> Uh, you know, I try to keep my personal opinions out of these things sometimes, but uh, this is just, yeah, uh, this is really awful. I can't tell if the voters are going to be aware of that kind of thing, because, you know, in the, days, in the days after the Oscar nominations, uh, 
the James Bulger murder case was, you know, one of the most read articles on Wikipedia. So then I thought, oh, okay, maybe this has hit the mainstream. But then again, you know, we had Kobe Bryant win an Oscar last year, and he's, you know, the only nominee in his category, animated short, who would have had any controversy, and it would have been much wider known. So I always wonder if, you know, narratives or controversies or that kind of thing actually have an impact on the voters or if they do set out to try to just vote for their actual favorites. And I mean, not for nothing this year in particular has proven us uh, nothing, uh, if not that they don't give a damn about certain controversies surrounding movies that they like. Um, I don't know if that'll extend to this one or not, but um, you know, I guess we'll see. And then you have Fove, which Again, I'll just say, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I was not prepared for that. I, I was not prepared for that. Oh, man, that is just... What happens, oh. Charlie? What's, What's that movie about? Uh, so you have these two kids. Uh, I guess they're probably about, you know, between like, you know, 10 or 12, something like that. Two boys. Um and they're, uh, and they're out just wandering around, and they're playing these game, this game of one-upping each other and they're keeping score and then they wander into a sulfur mine uh and when uh they see a truck coming towards them they run into one of the uh areas of sulfur they kind of, uh, each one of them at one point gets stuck but one of them gets stuck and starts sinking into the sulfur and hijinks ensue. Um, <laughs> I was wondering how much you're going to spoil. Yeah. yeah um, it's, it is, oh, it's a taxing watch. Oh man. It is just, oh, it, it is a tough watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was going and, for a, it was going for a poignancy that I don't think that the last scene earns. Um, it just, it, to me, it just, I felt like, Okay, we went through that, and now there's this. Okay, what's the point exactly? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's exactly what it is. It's like you know, you're you go through this, you know, heart is just soul crushing journey, and then you just go, and then you just say to yourself, "Why?" <laughs> yeah, and yeah. That's why I favor skin. I feel like there's a real arc to that story, whereas for you know, one thing happens, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. Which is very similar to what happens in the last nominee, Mother, um, which basically is is starts off really engrossed. I was actually really engrossed in this movie. Me too. Until it ended, and it just ends. The story is basically uh, a a a mother gets a phone call from her uh, six year old son who is vacationing with his father. And you hear the son over the phone, and the son says his father has vanished, and he doesn't know where he is. And it takes place in Spain. The son is vacationing with his father in France, and all he, all the son can say is that he's on a beach. And it's this frantic search for the mother to try to call the police and and try to get the son whose phone is dying to tell her where he is and look for landmarks. And it's really engrossing. Uh, it's it's mostly shot in just one continuous shot mm -hmm. um it's very kind of technically impressive and and the performance of the of the actress who plays the mother is is really just just chilling but then it ends well we should say it also ends with <laughs> the, the child apparently gets abducted by a vagrant <laughs> and as that was, it was the last this was the last short that I was watching. <laughs> and I was like, you have got another one? Seriously? Like four out of these five? <laughs> For real? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, and it just, and it just that happens and the movie just stops. Yeah. yeah. There, there's some kind of crazy music and then the, the end credits are kind of wobbling. So I, I feel like that might turn off some people in addition to how it just ends. Yeah, like it was trying to be like, isn't this so edgy and daring? Or, you know, it's like, oh my God, really? What is wrong with the people that voted for these movies? Have they been through some kind of trauma? Do they what? need a hug? Yeah, like what's going on here? I need a hug after watching these movies. Yeah, my God. 
So I don't know what I'm going to do with this category. I think I'm just going to predict Skin because it feels the most like a complete movie. But um, God, I could, just the, the way that this Oscar season has been going, I've got to prepare myself for detainment to win, I guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> with everything else. <laughs> Skin was the one that I just felt like was the best made film. Um, I feel like it had the best story and i think it's going to benefit with the fact that you actually do have these names um uh, that can you know i mean hell if the entire cast of this is us votes for skin just based on the one child that's in it hello there you go <laughs> um but i but i do feel like it's the one that tells like the most complete story um the fact that we're talking about blackface <laughs> so <laughs> much in the news now makes it kind of eerily i don't i don't think we've ever seen a blackface quite done this way so no, we have not put that, little, <laughs> put that little nugget out there yeah skin is also the only nominee in live action short that's actually from america we've got two from canada i think mothers from spain entertainment is from uh the uk so i wonder yeah racism is uniquely american but it does seem like you know most of us preferred skin and are also predicting it. Like I said, I really wanted to like Marguerite, but I just felt that it was too slight and kind of nothing happened. All right, but do we have any- But it's still, but I think it still could win only because it's the only one that in comparison to the other four is even mildly like puts a smile on your face. I, th I think that's the only thing that could make that a spoiler. Take a little bit of antidepressant medication before you watch these movies, and then. Uh, <laughs> and for then, the love of God, do watch these movies. Yeah, especially if you're trying to predict them. I mean, don't just go with whatever the frontrunners are because they're usually whatever came first alphabetically. <laughs>